and thank you for this conference, which is attended by, in this moment, from much more than 200 people. But I think that my first duty is to present myself. My name is uh, Franco Farinelli. Currently, I am uh, Professor Emeritus in Geography at Bologna University, but I spent a life, a scientific life, in uh, teaching and uh, uh, researching uh, all around the world. And starting from this millennium, I am very interested in the history and the logic and the nature of the Adriatic Sea. Also because I was born 70 years ago, just in front of Split, on the coast of the Abruzzi. And until now, in our family, we remember a lot of things which connect the life of my region, of the Abruzzi, with the coast of Oriental coast of Adriatic Sea. I will be the moderator of this morning, and I hope that no problem will be for you, because we will be able, not I, but the speaker, will be very, very able to catch your attention. Turn the hand of me. And uh, I'm sure that also, the topic of uh, nature issue we are going to discuss this morning will be very remarkable. And uh, we we very, very happy to sit together, to think together, and to reflect on our Adriatic Sea. Uh, the logo of this uh, conference is a wonderful, very ancient map of the Adriatic, uh, by which it's possible immediately to be plunged into the space-time perspective of an amphibious realm, that is the sea, the coast, the land, the relationship between them, and that is, I think, very, very important, because now, nowadays, we need, in a very urgent manner, a new, which means a very old model to think to the territory, because this is the problem now, to reinvent national territory because the Greek model of the modernity, the space, now it is in flight. I hope we will be, we will continue to, to debate all that this morning. But uh, immediately is very, very evident uh, uh, the relevance of this problem, not only for the Adriatic Sea, for our sea, but uh, in general, in a most more general perspective for the future of mankind. The objective of the initiative, co-founded by the Cross-Border Cooperation Programme Italy-Croatia 2014-2020, is to promote the shift toward sustainable tourism and the blue growth in the Adriatic Basin through the valorization of the huge maritime cultural heritage uh, of the hate Adriatic Italia and the Croatian port, Ancona, Ravenna, Venice, Trieste, Rijeka, Zada, Split, and Dubrovnik, four of which, four of which are Nowadays, UNESCO side. And as an expert of this matter, I can certify 
that such a network committed stubbornly in the reconstruction of a common identity, identity defined by the sharing of the same scene. And that is one of the first major, most important research of this project. Anyway, the first global goal of this conference is to inspire the audience with a broader debate over the connection between culture and sustainability, focusing on the case studies of policy. Secondly, we aim at highlighting the new opportunities provided by new technologies to transfer culture to many different audiences, and in particular, the possible match between the traditional museum experience and the remote immersive experience, giving the chance to overcome the lack of time or, it is in this case, evident the impossibility of traveling. So, I just add at the end of the very short introduction, only I heard that you have possibility to communicate with us uh, with uh, an address that uh, in a few seconds will appear on the your screen. But finally, we must remember. Remember, this is the acronym of our project. Remember, which means, you know, perhaps better than me, restoring the memory of Adriatic port side. Managing culture to foster balance territorial growth. This is the goal of this conference. I am sure that will be quite interesting in which we meet. We are attending for the address of this uh, Of our others, nothing on this way. So, so you should know that originally the project also agreed to conference in Venice to be organized in to be the beginning of May. Unfortunately, evidently, the COVID emerging. The COVID emergence uh, for the COVID emergence is not possible. Uh, all that. So, as the hope, as the hope of the meeting of this virtual meeting, I am very pleased to announce to introduce Mr. Pino Mussolino, Special Commissioner and Acting President of the North Adriatic Sea Port Authority. Mr. Mussolini, Mussolino, please. All the people connected today, I am extremely proud and uh, happy to be here today to celebrate the next stage of this uh, project. It was a project that was starting in 2016 in terms of ideas, but it was one of the first uh, projects that I uh, managed and handled when I became president of the Port Authority back in 2017. So I am uh, more proud as well of, of the app to the conclusion to certain things that we were starting. Uh, uh, well, some of the things were already anticipated are uh, eight ports uh, for 
uh, each uh, by uh, the two countries, a great uh, sharing of ideas and cultural heritage in this great sea that is our sea, the Adriatic Sea, uh, through which for centuries and millennia we have shared uh, life, efforts, uh, wars, friendship, and uh, a whole bunch of um, of, of knowledge and uh, and and and, and uh, cultural heritage. I'm I'm always surprised by the fact uh, that normally ports are are intended and meant as uh, spaces where you know they are evaluated only through the uh, the throughput of the goods and 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 by the market value, but they are very little. Uh, considered as great uh, builder of the cultural heritage of the place where they are. Uh, what would be Venice or Trieste or Ancona or Ravenna or uh, Rijeka, Zadar, Split and Dubrovnik, what would they be without their nature of being ports? Uh, so we had to develop and, and create this awareness that being a port city makes you much more than being simply a city. And there is so much that we share, and there is so much that we have developed together. Uh, think about the cultural heritage of, of the food and, 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 the, and, 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 the, and the culinary tradition, and about the beliefs and, and, and the things that we celebrate are very similar. And, and we have so uh, therefore contributed in being port cities so much in the identity, in you know, the, our Roman forefathers would have said in the genius logic, you know, uh, because we as ports have shaped the identity of the places where, where we are, where we are uh, established. And in, in this way, it was significant that nothing was or has been done so far in terms of selling these stories of these ports uh, enshrined in these beautiful historical cities that wouldn't be there if there were not port cities. And the wealth that create that was created by the ports was then transferred in the building of these beautiful monuments and palaces and and all the things that we really appreciate of, of our uh, of our of our cities. Uh, so the whole point was how can we transform this huge amount of information and this huge heritage in something that can be used and adopted and uh, and, and, and digested by a vast, vast majority of people in a very smart and, 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 friendly, uh, and friendly way. So we have developed this idea of the virtual museum. Uh, thanks to the actual uh, uh, technologies, we are able to create a, a box, a container of ideas, a container of information, a container of, of historical information that can be used everywhere, essentially, uh, through different platforms and, and when the project will be completed hopefully by by the end of by before the summer 2021 we will present to all uh, of you uh, the final results which will be a very very uh, user-friendly uh, portable way of, of um, uh, assessing a museum we are now on a different stage we don't need a physical place anymore in order to transfer information and to uh, expand knowledge and and this is a great example on how through the new technologies, augmented reality, uh, geo-referenced places, and QR codes, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have developed all together with all the eight partners uh, the, this great, beautiful project that is related to uh, you know, the cultural heritage of our, of our cities. And in doing so, we build up also a, a concept that is broader in terms of sustainability. Sustainability is not just talking about the environment. Uh, of course, that's, that's one of the pillars, and it's great and important, but sustainability means also an economic sustainability, uh, social sustainability, and more than anything in this case, a cultural sustainability. How can we match the identity of what we wear with the identity of what we are with the identity of what we aim to be in the future? Well, sharing knowledge, sharing ideas, sharing our past, in order to be more aware of what we are and what, where we are right now. And in this way, we can really build strong foundation in order to understand where we want to go in the next future. So uh, it's a beautiful example. And, and after my, my short um, speech, I will, I will pass to, to the video, which will explain in, 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 with, a, with a teaser 
what is going to be this beautiful virtual museum. But I'm, I'm very, very happy of what has been done so far. And I want to thank all the partners, of course, my, my dear friend, uh, Rodolfo Giampieri from Ancona, and who will speak after me, and all the other presidents. I, I had the luck and the privilege to work with all of you in these four years, and it has been a great experience, and it has strengthened in me even more the idea that we all belong to the same sea, the great Adriatic Sea, and that there is so much history uh, that we've built together. We have so, much, so many things in common. We have so much uh, in our past that will help us in foster and develop our future as well. So uh, again, thanks to all the partners, thanks to all our co-workers, you all worked well. The project is outstanding, the results, it's very, very uh, engaging and challenging and I like it very much and I hope that all the listeners and the future users of these platforms will enjoy it as much as I do. Uh, thank you so much everybody and I hope that the rest of the conference will uh, will keep up with the, with the good work. I've seen amazing outstanding speakers so I'm I'm really looking forward uh, to it. So uh, thank you and, and let's see the video. Venice rises from the heart of the lagoon in a limbo between land and sea, both as a refuge and an open door to new markets and new cultures. The relationship with the sea has been the lifeblood of Venice and its inland since the very first city settlements, bringing much prosperity from the times of the Republic of La Serenissima up to the present day. Over the centuries, the Venetian maritime port culture amazed the world with its innovative technologies, proposing successful engineering solutions like the invention of the assembly line which was experimented in the infernal Rassana dei Veneziani that had so filled Dante Alighieri, Middle Ages, with ominous wonder. The same spirit that animated the Venetian arsenal in ancient times is still alive today in Porto Marghera, a forge of productivity and services fueled by the many entrepreneurial realities that, looking out over the sea, continue to hold a fundamental stake in port facilities. An invisible thread ties together the ancient and modern of Venice's maritime port culture. All one needs to do is think of the gigantic columns transported by sea from Constantinople and erected on the Palace Pier of St. Mark's in the 13th century. They are not only symbols of the artistic splendor of the city, but they are also monuments of the daring ingenuity capable of handling majestic, extraordinary loads. Passed down through the centuries, this skill still distinguishes the Venetian port facilities, still at the Italian forefront in handling exceptional cargo and more. The trade and industry of the Veneto region and of the Italian Northeast have always lived in symbiosis with the port reality. Discovering the past and present of this relationship with the sea can help give us a glimpse of what the future of the territory holds. The virtual museum of the Port of Venice aims to lead the explorer in the rediscovery of the key locations in this millenary reality. From the ancient fishing tradition of the Port of Chioggia, to the evolution of Venice's trade routes in the Mediterranean, to the Far East, but also to Northern Europe. From the historic excellence of the Venetian arsenal to the entrepreneurship operating in today's port. The virtual museum of the Port of Venice will be accessible through many devices, it will allow you to navigate the exhibit even from home, discovering the Venetian maritime port culture in an immersive way, traveling through time, retracing ancient routes, and interacting and discovering the secrets of symbolic monuments of the city. It is an ambitious project, but also one that is accessible to all, combining history and technology through 3D models, augmented reality and interactive contents, innovative tools to immerse yourself in the past, to know the present, and imagine the future of Venetian maritime culture. The Virtual Museum of the Port of Venice, tracing the routes towards the future.
a lot of thanks to you, Mr. Mussolino, for your uh, speech and many compliments for your video travel. I'm sure that uh, the entire audience is looking forward to exploring the past, the present, and the future of the Port of Venice, thanks to this different experience we will provide by the end of the next summer. And now, moving to the second institution, I am pleased to introduce to you Mr. Rodolfo Giampieri, President of the Central Asiatic Port Authority, playing the role of the project leader. Buongiorno, buongiorno. I want to thank all those who have worked for this project to uh, to materialize. I want to thank my friend Pino Musolino, whom with this video has really moved all of us and has shown how a city like Venice can become the ambassador in the world of beauty, of culture and history above all. It is very interesting for us to be part of this project because it is part of an interesting framework, the macro region, Ionian Adriatic macro region that has found in the sea the connection between the two shores, the Balkans and the Italian Adriatic. This macro region has taught us to overcome nationalism, borders, to speak a single language. In a sea, we should interpret as a fluid bridge joining the two shores that must have a common ling language in my view and should develop common projects identifying a common development and remember is a common project that joins us that brings us to a synthesis of our needs and creates the framework into which we can propose one of the basic elements of development culture our development has to be based on culture, on cultural tourism, on quality tourism. And this concept that brings the ports back to the focus of attention is interesting from many points of view. First of all, because it creates a correct balance between port and communities. Somehow this balance had been overthrown in the past and uh, the dialogue between cities and ports had been interrupted in many cases. And this is one of the reasons why the relationship between port and city, port and community is again topical in this moment. Ports have to be considered the uh, ambassadors of the blue economy. They should be the places through which the blue economy, which should not just be a name, can bring about a real development. We have fisheries, uh, we have jobs, we have tourists, we have passengers, we have history and monuments. So the uh, our civilization that had developed through the sea finds its essence in the port cities that have a single, uh, that are the single uh, gateway to uh, our mainland. And this brings ports back to the concept of identity. 
identity is one of the important themes that have to be discussed again, it should not be a limit in uh, um, uh, constraining our development. It should rather be the route on which a different future will develop. We should not pretend that COVID-19 is changing our perceptions, is changing some uh, certainties we had, some values we should reinterpret as fast as possible. And uh, the rediscovery of the economic role of port cities by their communities is extremely important. If we connect this to the idea that the roots of a territory, uh, the roots of a community have developed around ports, and this is something we can certainly uh, discover if we look at the historic monuments we have uh, within ports, I think we can really find a new way to uh, develop a new kind of, de of development. Development is something you build every day, you conquer every day, and uh, Pino Mussolino and many other uh, presidents of the port authorities are uh, discussing this and facing this every day, bringing at the center of our development these elements that belong to all of us and cannot be uh, forgotten environmental sustainability is one of the pillars of the new sensitivities we must respond to this request for uh, sustainability new ideas are essential technology will certainly help us in rediscovering environmental sustainability as a philosopher used to say, everybody wants to go back to nature, but nobody wants to go there walking on foot. We should support, uh, we should have technology support our new uh, developments. Environmental sustainability is not enough it has to be accompanied by economic and social sustainability. Otherwise, it is just empty words. I, I used to say that my teachers, when I was a, a schoolboy, used to give us a title and we had to develop the title of the composition we were assigned by the teacher. Today, we only stop at the titles without really uh, developing uh, uh, our uh, assignment. We were discussing this with Pino Mussolino yesterday. The pressure we are subjected to, the responsibilities we have to face, the decisions you have to make every day in a world that is rapidly changing as our uh, paradigms are changing. I think we should carry out a thorough analysis of these themes. We should somehow be well connected to the need for change that the modern world is requiring. But this clashes against bureaucracy that makes everything more difficult. If changing the uh, use of a port area uh, 
provides us with uh, the recovery of a whole part of the port uh, system, uh, opening it up to the city with its monuments. A starting point for uh, uh, many uh, journeys of the past. We have important historical spaces in port areas that have to be opened up and given back to the cities to change destinations to uh, to develop our link with the city will necessarily bring us to face bureaucracy and the request of a large number of authorizations. And this is something that is quite heavy for us to, uh, to face every day. I want to stress how technology is streamlining our efforts. We are speaking to each other today, being uh, far away, uh, not close to each other. And technology can certainly give us a response. The velocity of our technolo technological development has, uh, has brought people to uh, forget about the need for uh, technical times. We will certainly have to face some problems. Uh, a virtual museum, creating relationships among different realities would be impossible without technology. I think these uh, radical changes in society uh, after uh, uh, electricity, after the great inventions of the past, uh, the web, uh, the uh, world of advanced technologies is really our next frontier. With this initiative today, we become part of the change. We speak the language of modernity, although respecting our history starting from our culture. Something we should uh, revitalize, approaching it with a modern uh, uh, approach. I think today we should somehow enjoy our ports. Uh, the community should be able to, uh, to use and enjoy uh, its ports. Uh, I will stop my contribution by stressing the importance of this project. And I want to thank all those who have worked and are still working and will work in the future for this project, an ambitious project that based on past history is trying to interpret the future with a technological network. And this is one of the ways to restore correct relationships, correct balance, the correct balance between ports and cities, between ports and people, but above all, to focus our attention on, on the sea. It has always been at the center of our attention in theory, but we have to be aware that these fluid bridges I was referring to can really facilitate relationships as was in the past. The Adriatic has always been a, a tool to put cultures together, to harmonize cultures and to uh, uh, carry out uh, uh, trade among the two shores. I want to thank all those who are working believing in this uh, idea, stressing the fact that a future starting from the past should be able to overcome barriers and uh, borders above all. Thank you.
Okay, I was saying, uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, thank you to you, Mr. Giampieri, also because you stressed a very important point, that identity means relationship with other people and with technology. And now, finally, last but not least, I give the floor to Mr. Federico Rosset, representing the Veneto region, the managing authority of the Italy-Croatia program. Mr. Rosset, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Farinelli. Um, first of all, let me bring to, to all of you, Commissioner Musolino, Port authorities, national, regional and local authorities, dear participants and ladies and gentlemen, the greetings and the congratulations of uh, Veneto region for writing and then implementing this project, remember, uh, that we consider very, very interesting for at least uh, three uh, reasons that we um, briefly uh, we would like to to share to share with you i've been informed that um, we have the support of interpreters and i thank them in uh, in advance for their support so if you don't mind i switch to uh, italian Rising from the significance of uh, promoting the Adriatic Sea's heritage, which is mainly tuned to uh, the generation of economy of uh, flows, including tourist flows. We all know how important tourism is, how essential tourism is for our economies. We also know which are the numerous problems that tourism engenders in addition to its benefits. There are many uh, territorial cooperation projects, not only with Croatia, but also with other countries that have focused on these very important issues. We are now at the end of a seven year uh, period and we can uh, try and draw the conclusions of what we have seen over the last few years. And what we do see is that the critical issues associated to tourism Um, we have noticed that tourism tends to be concentrated on uh, the, in, in, uh, in uh, specific areas, in specific seasons and on specific uh, uh, topics. So the tourists uh, usually tend to go and see the same thing as time and time again. The um, three projects, uh, these, but this, the, the project has tried to identify a solution to these problems with the aim of uh, finding ways uh, to ensure that uh, tourism was more disseminated throughout the territory to include less known areas to ensure that tourism uh, is no longer focused on specific uh, uh, peak seasons during the year and also by providing a broader offer that is from the point of view of the themes if you like which are offered to tourism to tourists uh, Ports are a natural place uh, of concentration, if you like, of uh, tourism in addition to uh, goods. So the uh, traffic made up not only of cargo but also of people. Ports are also very much at the forefront in terms of concentration because they do see all those uh, flows as they happen and they directly um, 
they are directly affected by the problems associated there too, which leads me to say that uh, ports are indeed the privileged observers as they can access data and they can see um, trends that other subjects and other parties maybe uh, see with a certain delay. Another consideration is associated uh, to something which I mentioned. Because they are privileged uh, observers, uh, the ports themselves become part of the problem, but luckily because they are part of the problem, by developing awareness and promoting awareness, they can become part of the solution. As we have seen in this uh, seven-year period, ports have uh, contributed to solve numerous problems associated to this issue through uh, by developing uh, projects associated to reducing bureaucracy, uh, green ports uh, and other initiatives. And the issue which is uh, promoted through Remember, the promotion of different ways of uh, benefiting of uh, the heritage uh, of a place. So, for a start, as I was saying, they are main observers. At the same time, they are very important players who have become aware of the situation and are therefore trying to mitigate the effects of uh, tourism, the negative effects of tourism. Another consideration arises from the fact that uh, we are very satisfied uh, by projects such as Remember that enable us to uh, provide new life uh, to uh, the um, spirit uh, which underlie uh, European financing that uh, should support uh, not uh, uh, projects that one can do with one's own resources but to do those activities and perform those activities that one would not be able to do without uh, uh, external funds. Now, uh, Mr. Mussolino was positively struck by the things that Port can do in the area of culture. It's a beautiful discovery, if you like, and for all to see. It is a natural evolution for Port, uh, in the Adriatic in particular, to have so much to offer also from the point of view of culture and uh, heritage and therefore also in association to tourism. The topic of territorial cooperation should serve the purpose, therefore, of uh, driving the players beyond their core activities for which they have their own resources, which are used for that specific purpose. These uh, funds and this financing have the aim of exploring new frontiers to increase the breadth uh, of uh, our field of action. And as uh, President Giampieri was saying, it is a topic uh, in which the Marche region of have always been at the forefront. The Veneto region is also interested in following the strategies that have been uh, um, implemented uh, both in this and in the Alpine areas. These are all tools that enable us to uh, broaden our field of action and we are therefore particularly pleased to see how this project has very originally used the funds uh, for territorial cooperation, uh, thereby avoiding any uh, financing of own uh, activities and core activities. We uh, think that uh, the Remember project really does stand out as an example. The project has been carried out uh, excellently and we are very curious to see what the results of this project will be. Thank you. Many times, because uh, your speech uh, is a very good introduction to our Kenya speech. Uh, the port 
as a cultural hub, which means the port as a place in which we have a lot of skills in symbolic manipulations. So, who better than UNESCO to speak about culture as a driver of sustainable cities? Is a very rhetoric question because uh, I am pleased, really pleased, to introduce to you our guest of honor, Mr. Ernesto Otone Ramirez, who is the assistant director general for culture of UNESCO. Prior to this position, Mr. Otone Ramirez had as child, first Minister of Culture, Arts and Heritage from 2015 to 2018. And as Minister of Culture, he created a Department of First People, a migrants unit, and threatened copyright laws and heritage protection. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramirez, and the floor is yours now. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Uh, so, first of all, it's my great pleasure to join you for this conference, examining the first results of the Remember project. As you said before, to restore the memory of Adriatic port cities, including several sites on the UNESCO World Heritage List, as driver of sustainable development in the region. Thanks you to the North Adriatic Seaport Authority for your kind invitation. Well, as you said before, port cities such as Ancona, Ravenna, Trieste, Venice, Rijeka, Zada, Dubrovnik, and Split are places of rich cultural heritage and creativity. Over one third of World Heritage sites are port cities. Many of the 246 members of the UNESCO Creative Cities Network are also port cities, including big cities like Santos, Shanghai or Barcelona. By the very nature, port cities are melting pots of peoples, cultures and also values. They are a place of openness, diversity and inclusivity. This naturally led uh, to economic, social, and for sure, cultural vibrancy, as exchange and cooperation brings about innovative ideas, approaches, solution, and values, as I said before. Driven, uh, driven by the cultural vibrancy of, and heritage, port cities can play an important role in achieving the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Port cities are crucial vectors of history and tradition, culture and heritage, but also, as I said, creativity and for sure, innovation. They are finding uh, important solution to the promotion of sustainable and resilient tourism, international mobility, climate change and the sustainable use of ocean resources, to name only a few. Um, the challenges uh historic port cities are all times uh facing important challenges and unesco regularly monitors the state of conservation of port cities of the world heritage list a lack of integrated managers management system lack of conservation many times the impact of over tourism and climate change are all common challenges facing all these sites we know that tourism is a significant economic driver for many Adriatic port cities. Ports are tourist gateways and important cultural tourist destinations in their own right. With centuries of history, these former maritime powers are home to impressive architectures, art and cultural attractions that draws millions of visitors from across the world each year. For port cities, Tourism creates opportunities for local economic development, investment in a revenue for conservation. We know that tourism helps 
uh, helps raise awareness about cultural heritage, restoring the memory of Adriatic ports and the need to protect its rich heritage for future generation. As I mentioned, a number of port cities participating in the Remember project are World Heritage Sites, as well as some of Euro uh, Europe's most popular destinations. Over the year, properties such as Venice and, Dubro and Dubro Dubrovnik have witnessed an exponential growth in visitors and congestion during peak season, which has placed an increased strain on management system, infrastructure, and also local communities. The picture in 2020 is very different, as you know. The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in widespread travel restriction and the closure of major tourist destinations around the world. If we follow the World Tourist Organization recent uh, figures, show that international tourist arrivals dropped by 65% during the first half of this year, equating to a loss of about more than 460 billion in export revenues. The impact of this decrease in tourists has been particularly hard on port cities, which have lost important revenues for local communities and the conservation of their cultural um, heritage. The Cruise Line International Association estimates that more than 200,000 European jobs have been lost due to the suspension of cruise operation alone. So, in response, UNESCO has convened a task force on cultural and resilient tourism with advisory body to the World Heritage Committee, IUCN, ICOMOS and ICROM. The task force is leading a global dialogue to explore how the current pose in global travel can be used to develop new inclusive models and approaches to ensure a resilient and sustainable tourist recovery that somehow rejuvenates communities, creates the jobs that we need, promotes culture and protects heritage and its transmission. A roadmap addressing key issues uh, will be developed in the next weeks and months. This builds, um, like in, in June of this year, UNESCO uh, held a, we <coughs> a webinar, sorry, focused on the impact of COVID-19 on World Heritage, Heritage Cities. Major and heritage officials from the Mediterranean port city of Dubok, Dubrovnik and Tunis participated in, the, in this meeting and highlighted the negative impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on their cities. However, they also noted that the sudden loss of tourists represent maybe some opportunity to reflect on how sustainable cultural tourism can help communities to build back better in the wake of the pandemic. UNESCO is also home uh, to other tools that can support port cities to harness their rich cultural and heritage as driver of sustainable development. The 2011 UNESCO recommendation of the Huel Historic Urban Landscape proposes a holistic understanding of cities that can be especially useful for port cities, given their urban and cultural complexity. The Hull recommendation integrates the goals of urban heritage conservation with those of social and economic development. This method sees urban heritage as a social, cultural and economic resource for development of the cities. It is a tool to integrate policies and practices of conservation of the built environment into the wider goals of sustainable urban development. Detailed steps for the implementation of the recommendation are available uh, on the UNESCO website. There is no question that urban conservation has become a key strategy for achieving sustainable urban development, including the achievement of SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities. In the last months, the UNESCO launched the Culture 2030 Indicators that represents another potential resource for port cities as they work to achieve the SDG 11. 
This indicator, a thematic framework for measuring the role of contribution of culture in the 2030 agenda at the local, but also at the national level, uh, can help to achieve this uh, agenda. Many of these indicators to urban issues, such as governance, management frameworks, and heritage mapping in historic city are very present. Based on the experience of some World Heritage Port cities, we can draw some clear lessons regarding major works within or near World Heritage properties. For one, the World Heritage Center and the World Heritage Committee must be involved in major projects from their very conception to ensure the adequate integration of development and heritage conservation needs. At the same time, infrastructure projects must formally involve and consult local communities, as we heard um, the excellencies before, and stakeholders such as heritage site manager, port authorities, city planning authorities, and local government should be part of all the discussions. Moreover, major infrastructure works have the potential to include a conservation dimension within the project that could support programs for our traditional sustainable livelihoods and traditional practices, including traditional building practices, as well as oral tradition that are very important for many communities. In general, port and maritime heritage should be protected in order to reflect its historical meaning while being compatible with the needs of local communities. That are several strategies to achieve uh, this balance. Well, as port cities adapt to changing economic and political environment, cultural heritage and the built environment can provide an opportunity for future. Sustainable development be, must be the goal. For instance, for instance, port cities can build on their port identity, as we heard before, to develop other areas of their economy, including a new way of doing tourism. The movement of ports outside of city centers offers a big opportunity to reclaim the central part of the city's identity for the public use. Waterfront spaces, port and maritime heritage should be protected and preserved prioritizing public uses that enhance the level ability of the city. Obsolete port infrastructure can be adapted, as it has been in many of your ports, for reuse as cultural facilities following a value-based approach. Some recent examples include the Bassin des Lumières, a former submarine base in Bordeaux, that is now the largest digital art center in the world. Intervention like this helps preserve the built heritage of the port by ensuring its continuous use and at the same time trying it with local culture and creativity. Before I, I end my remarks, I wanted to highlight the challenges facing another port city outside the Remember initiative, that of the UNESCO Creative City of Beirut. As you know, on 4th August, Beirut was severely damaged by two devastating uh, explosions, which damaged cultural heritage and cultural life, particularly in and around its port area. In response, UNESCO launched the Lee Beirut Initiative, which aims to support emergency intervention and medium-term strategy to reconstruct cultural heritage and revive cultural life in Beirut. Uh, as we went there with the Director General, Madame Audrey Azoulay, we were very impressed how a port can disappear, a whole part of the port. And uh, it makes us uh, reflect about how we should ensure those preservation for future generation. I know that a key goal of the Remember project is to create a network amongst the eight participating, participating port cities rooted in a shared vision of cultural based territorial development. Allow me to take this opportunity to encourage all port cities to join 
UNESCO in solidarity with Beirut to support the city in its recovery. In closing, I would like to congratulate on this conference and the Remember initiative. This initiative comes at a crucial time as the global health crisis has given us a moment to reflect on what kind of future we want for port cities and their inhabitants. I have no doubt that this project will contribute to safeguarding the cultural heritage of these iconic port cities, building on their cultural heritage and creativity in support of the sustainable regional development. Thank you so much for giving us, as UNESCO, the opportunity to participate. And I really hope to have uh, reflecting great exchanges with all the experts that are today with you. Thank you so much. Thank you to you, Mr. Ramirez. You placed in a more broad, general, global context, you placed uh, in a more general context to in a more general context the, 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 the history, the case of uh, Adriatic Sea Port, which is, which is, we believe, the only manner to appreciate and to stress uh, their specific and uh, quite delicate nature. Thanks a lot again. And now we uh, begin to give relevance on the cultural heritage of port cities to contribute to a successful design of their transformative resilience. Just to mention a concept stressed in the 2050 ONU agenda. The first aspect that will bring a contribution on this matter is Ms. Carola Hein. Professor and Head, History of Architecture and Urban Planning, Chair at Deaf University of Technology. Ms. Hein, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks a lot for the invitation and congrat congratulations to all the stakeholders in the Remember project for the excellent work that you have already done. I would like to share a couple of bring some additional insights into what um, we uh, what we are discussing here. So just to make sure that you can see my slides, quick confirmation would be great. What I would like to talk about today is in the in light of the topic of the cultural dimension of Port City Vision, to talk first about um, the role that culture has always had in making port cities resilient. Through the ages, and I think that's what we've already heard this morning, port and city actors have collaborated to facilitate trade flows, people flows, and the flows of ideas. And this relationship between a port and city has over the time been a very resilient one responding to various changes and challenges and picking up these challenges in very innovative ways. So there is a certain port city culture, I would argue, that makes these cities particularly resilient through time and also provides them with the capacity to adapt to future challenges. But when we talk about culture and port city culture, Let's just remember what the definition of culture is, because we've heard this morning two different approaches, one on cultural heritage and with a focus on heritage, tangible and intangible heritage as um, 
uh, as seen in many of these cities as, as, as real buildings, as historical um, elements. But we've also seen a very strong culture coming out of the port stakeholders who are taking this action through Remember to revive the historic elements, to build on the beliefs, uh, social forms, the, the structures that have made these cities big over time. So in this sense, I would argue that culture is more than heritage. Obviously, it's heritage. We need to preserve that. And uh, Mr. Otona made a wonderful point about that. But understanding the history of the built environment in institutions in port cities can also help us shape the future and engage with the challenges that all these port cities are facing. So this attempt in Remember to understand the past in a more concise way is the foundation to build sustainable port city regions of the future. And so this port city culture is embedded in buildings, urban structures, but it's also part of the life of the people, of organizations, their behaviors and practices. And the ways in which the ports of the Adriatic are now taking up the Remember project shows, in my opinion, the very uh, strong element that they are the very long history and the traditional engagement in innovation and preservation of the past at the same time. So how can port city culture then help develop the cities of the future? And one of the important elements uh, that I think we need to recognize is that the port is not just a bounded entity. The influence of the port extends from the foreland, from the sea and from the ships, from all the installations in the sea to the nearby cities, their headquarters, infrastructures and the larger hinterland. And we've heard several times already today the need to look at a regional collaboration and the Remember project already does that through the collaboration of all of these ports, addressing also the need to uh, plan the hinterland together with the various municipalities and other um, areas around it. So port city culture should be a part of sustainable port city region development which means that we need to look at this at port and city together and find out what is the value of the port for the city and what's the value of the neighboring city and region for the port. Um, we've done a couple, a colleague did a couple of uh, exercises with students looking at mind maps. So he asked the students, 100 students in the class to draw the port city of Rotterdam. And the result, as you can see on the screen, is very much the imaginary of the port itself, of cranes, of logistics, of port basins. But I think what we need in order to plan the port of the future, we need a much more complex understanding that the city also plays a part in the port city. And here are a couple more of these slides. So to really plan for the future, we need to acknowledge the long-term history, which is embedded in a lot of spatial structures. Port investments are very long living and very expensive and they don't go away very quickly. But so they need to be acknowledged in the development of the, of the city. And the institutions often have their own historical past, which also needs to be taken into account as we understand where we stand and where we want to go in the future. And so in that sense, incorporating heritage into port city development, using heritage as an agent in sustainable development, means also going beyond the uh, buildings themselves, but building on these longer institutional uh, ph physical structures that we have. And we already heard from uh, Mr. Otone how the Mediterranean as a shared sea shaped all the cities that we're talking about and actually many more and we can see that lots of the world heritage sites are coastal cities are port cities that are all interconnected and that are um, shaped by the same forces of the sea 
So we've tried to bring this, these ideas on Port City resilience together in a film, which I'm not going to show you now, but I'm just going to give you a couple of ideas of saying, how can we link? So these are some screenshots from the film, which we will launch shortly. How are port and city, water and land interconnected through time? What's the role of uh, art and culture in it? So the understanding of historical paintings uh, helps us, of historical culture, helps us understand this particular relationship and bring together citizens, agents in the vicinity, stakeholders, to address the challenges that we are currently facing, including climate change, changing weather patterns, but also digitization, migration, and other of these urgencies. So if we need to address these, in order to address these various urgencies that we are facing, uh, urgencies of dualities, of heritage and migration, of new technologies, of uh, mobility and livability, for example, we need to bring all the stakeholders in the area together and to engage in transition strategies. So this requires long-term perspectives, multi-scalar investigation, and multidisciplinary collaborations. So all of these are already part of what we are hearing in the REMEMBER project today. So again, congratulations on this project. Now, there may be um, one more thing that I would like to share, a couple, uh, one more um, thought. We've been working on trying to understand how these historical collaborations have worked out in different cities. And we're currently working on a comparative assessment of this water, land, port city, port city region development in various cities. So I'm showing you here, just as an example, the case of Rotterdam, um, to see how this partnership between port and city has played out over time. And when you closely examine these, this, this mapping, you see how, in the case of Rotterdam, the port has often taken the lead with the city trying to catch up to the development. Those similar maps on London or on Hamburg show very different patterns, also in terms of the evolution of the institutional frameworks that go hand in hand with it. In the case of Hamburg, for example, you see that the, uh, the city and the port have maintained the, kind of, the same kind of institutional boundaries. That kind of analysis, I think, can help us understand particular path dependencies, see who is in, in the lead of a specific development. In the case of Rotterdam, I would argue that the port has long been in the lead. And to understand what were the paradigms that have driven these kinds of relationships. So in the case of Rotterdam, the, it has been a staple port, it became a transit port, raising the question, what kind of port Rotterdam, for example, wants to be in the future, and what its engagement with the city and region surrounding it should be. So raising again the question, what can be the value of the immediate neighborhood? And so a group of students worked on a project to see how to regain the lost connection with the, with the city beyond it. So to see how far does the reach of the water into the hinterland actually go and what are the institutions, the businesses, the people that are intimately connected to the port? They use this analysis to develop transition strategies looking into the future. And I think it's important as we look sometimes thousands of years back into the past on port city relationships to also try and understand what the port city relationships in a long term future will be and not just in the short term. So what the students then developed was a multifunctional zone for the port of Rotterdam, including patterns for bird migration, new energies, housing districts, uh, and trying to figure out where the port would be, or the port city would be in the year 2080. And that included a, a couple of more vision, visual um, visualizations that were more in the imaginary part trying to think about automated cleanup of polluted soils, but it also includes um, analysis of the port city relationships from the hinterland to the foreland, 
through much larger um, connections. So recognizing that this is really not only about one line that is between port and city, but that there are many dimensions in the relationship between port, city, region that have to be analyzed. In fact, often the, the impact of a port like Rotterdam, and I'm sure that many of the ports in the Adria too, can occur 100, 200 kilometers in the, uh, further on in the hinterland. So trying to understand the port city region as an ecosystem with all of its elements, including heritage, as an important driver for sustainable development. And when you put that into more concrete terms, you could think about cruise shipping, the way it impacts the hinterland, and trying to bring in other types of museum, other types of trips that are not always concentrated on the same elements. It can also include new ways of understanding this relationship and bringing port city uh, connections closer to, to the users. In this case, students developed a game which they called Harbor Hustle um, that has a four different types of agents of port city development, which each have their own uh, goals to play. But the end of each round that you play in this game determines whether Earth a whole is still in existence. So that kind of games may help citizens understand what the role of modern ports is and to recreate traditional bounds between citizens and other stakeholders. Um, we are also working on a, on a MOOC, on an open online course to get better understanding of adaptive strategies for water ports and historic cities, looking at the ways in which port cities have traditionally evolved and what that uh, can mean, how we can bring in people into a better understanding of the relationship between port and cities. And all of these discussions, um, and I think this is important, potentially important also for the, for the Remember project, we are currently developing an, a UFM action plan or the UFM um, with the UFM, which will be launched this Friday. And in this action plan with colleagues, we're working on uh, port cities as, a, as an axis of sustainable development for the hinterland with exactly the goal that you're also pursuing to see how these historical long-term developments have shaped the present how they can be used to define and refine and redesign the future in a way that is sustainable, inclusive, and also just for all the populations in there. So thank you very much um, for the opportunity to share a couple of ideas. And again, lots, many thanks um, for the invitations and congratulations on your project. Thanks to you, Madame Hein. And of how we design the future. I dare to make it just a little paraphrase or a few sentences and to say, according to your meaning, part is the foundation of how we design the future. Thanks again, Madame Marie. <laughs> Thanks again. And now, Mr. Jose Sanchez responsible for the development of AIVP 2030 Agenda, co-manager of the Pope Center Network and the Expert Network, and coordinator of content on Pope City Community and Environmental Affairs. The floor is yours, Mr. Sanchez. Well, I'm well, thank you, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction and for uh, inviting us to join this uh, this great initiative in the framework of the Remember Project. We had planned actually a conference in Venice this year, but unfortunately, for the well-known reasons, it uh, it couldn't uh, it couldn't happen. 
Uh, nevertheless, uh, it's always good to join these conversations and these debates about such a culture, such a crucial aspect that is uh, uh, port uh, port culture, port city culture. Now, um, it's always also a challenge to present after uh, Professor Carola Hein, but I will do my best to bring some valuable inputs. And I want to congratulate as well the, uh, the team in charge of uh, assembling the program because I think it's very well, it creates a very good flow between the institutional uh, message and the concepts and ideas that we have seen from uh, UNESCO and Professor Carola Hein. And now we'll go a bit more into the tools that can be used to uh, disclose uh, port city culture, particularly port centers in our case. Now, I always like to uh, introduce, uh, to use these three images to make a very quick uh, review of the evolution of the port city relationship. Um, here we can see that how it has evolved from a very uh, organic interaction between port and city, as it's visible here in this image of the port of, uh, of Marseille, and how it uh, evolves gradually a bit to uh, stronger separation uh, when the port becomes an industrial place, but we still see people uh, nevertheless here interacting with the port. Here is Lisbon in the beginning of the 20th century to uh, a very strong separation both physically and socially, uh, even uh, through a demaritimization process of the broader uh, port territories in which the citizens are very often no longer welcome and they, they no longer feel welcome. And this is something that we see during the entire 20th uh, century and evolution. And of course, this is linked to all the well-known problems that have, uh, are often associated uh, with, uh, with ports such as the environmental issues, uh, traffic, uh, regulation that separates the port and so on. And here is a bit uh, where AVP functions. AVP is a worldwide network of port cities. So what we do is exactly that, is try to break this uh, these, uh, separation between port city and citizen and try to bring them uh, close together. And this is what we have done for over 30 years uh, uh, with now more than 180 members worldwide and trying to share the valuable knowledge with port authorities, municipalities, regions, and so on, and companies and universities in order to try to find a sustainable port city interaction and in a way also contribute to sustainable uh, development worldwide. And this is our most recent initiative, is the AVP Agenda 2030 that was launched just uh, uh, less, a bit less than two years ago. And what we actually do is try to, uh, what we do is to adapt the 17 sustainable development goals that are part of the global sustainable development agenda and adapt it to the port city uh, context in order to make it very clear what can port city actors do in order to contribute to this global uh, goal or this global intention that is sustainable development and how this can be uh, more efficiently requested in the port city interaction. So what we do was uh, identify uh, 10 key areas in which port city actors can actually develop action and strategies. Um, and here we see uh, all of them, they are very well known uh, areas of expertise by all port city experts. And uh, of course, uh, each one of them, we don't have time today to go into the detail in, uh, in all of them. Each one, each goal has uh, uh, specific actions that uh, these port city actors can, can take. To, our goal is then to, to bring a certain guidance uh, toward this uh, sustainable port city relationship. And uh, today I'm going to present a tool that is particularly valuable for four of these 10 uh, main goals. So it's, uh, it's going to affect governance, human capital, uh, port city culture and identity, of course, and the port city, city interface. But mostly, of course, port culture and identity. Before moving into the definition of the tool, it's important to acknowledge the changes that are taking place in port cities and in, uh, in port actors, particularly in port authorities. We see an evolution that is trying to compensate this separation that we saw in the images before. So uh, from a priority, uh, uh, a very clear and almost exclusive priority on economic performance, we see a gradual evolution integrating environmental performance and in some years already also social performance. And this is something that is visible in uh, different uh, documents 
and different, uh, different initiatives that are developed by international organizations, including ourselves. And this also, I think it reflects a bit the idea that was, I was discussing the other day in another webinar, is that how ports evolve from logistic and economic hubs into value hubs with a much broader understanding of the contribution to society, much uh, beyond the traditional values of uh, labor and economic impact towards more social, other social uh, dimensions. Now, the tool that I wanted to, to discuss today is uh, port centers. And we consider port centers as the base to renew the sports city relationship. It's something that we have been defended already, defending for some years. And in, in the origin, original definition as a port center is uh, really um, a place in which uh, ports and port cities can centralize its uh, social uh, agenda in order to um, boost a remaritimization re process of the port city territory. It can, it, it should include an exhibition place and a forum for discussion to explain the port for real, we could say, to break this, um, this bad image that very often port have carried due to its association with certain negative externalities and show uh, a more complex understanding of the contribution that ports can bring uh, to, to society. Of course, this also allows then new sorts of interaction uh, with a much broader network of, of actors with the end goal of actually um, building and increasing social cohesion um, based on, ex again, explaining properly uh, the port uh, based on, on the entertainment principles so it can embrace all different um, ages. We have defended this, creating a port center network, bringing these different uh, places, these different port centers from all over the world together into a network to share good practices. We have developed publications that explain a bit of a uh, step-by-step uh, process to develop a port center. We have also uh, created a, a port center charter with the 10 key principles to, um, that should be included in, in a proper port center. But what I want really to focus in today is the evolution that we have seen since the concept was first implemented in the first ports to what we have today. And I think it's something that very, uh, it relates very well to the end goals of the Remember project and the, the foreseeable end result or end product, if we want, end tool, the final tool that the Remember project will eventually uh, include. So in the first generation, and I will go a bit uh, quickly because we have no, we don't have so much time. In the first generation, we see how um, main ports in, in Europe, such as uh, Antwerp and Rotterdam, with uh, considerable economic resources, decided to develop uh, these, uh, these places, these tools. They built these uh, specific buildings in order to explain the port to the uh, younger population with the uh, clear intention of assuring the renewal of the human capital present of the port. And this was uh, with a considerable effort um, and a considerable uh, investment. This is in a place that was a bit far from the uh, city area or from the port city interface. They were located right in the middle of the port area. This is, we see the example of Antwerp already in the uh, late 80s, and we see a bit uh, later uh, in Rotterdam uh, in the early 90s, a similar concept again with the same uh, with the same idea, trying to show the port as an attractive place for youngsters to develop a, a prosperous career, and in a way guaranteeing this uh, new human capital that is necessary to continue the innovation flow in the port and to continue the productivity of of the port. Later, in uh, already in the in the first decade of the 2000s and the, the 21st century we see uh, a second generation emerge and uh, we see for example the case of uh, the port center in, in Genoa that again is a physical location but this time in the port city interface in the waterfront uh, next to the famous project of uh, uh, Renzo Piano and uh, again the goal is to explain how the port actually functions in order to break these negative cliches that affect the image of the port because what we actually see and this is what the demaritimization process that I was mentioning before means is that actually the people, the citizens living in port cities or port territories no longer understand what the port is or what the port means 
to to its daily life and to even to the uh, local identity, as we, we were mentioning before. There has been uh, this separation has left certain um, scars, we could say, in this interaction. We can see other cases, for example, in the in Le Havre in in France where again different actors uh, from the port city uh, work together to explain the port to uh, to the broader uh, audience again focusing on explaining as the port is for real uh, today we see uh, but then also we gradually see an evolution in terms of the cooperation with other culture maritime cultural institutions and this is the case of bilbao where we hosted a, a meeting of our network not long ago and here, for example, the Port Authority decided to cooperate with the uh, Maritime Museum, the local Maritime Museum, in order to dedicate a space of the Maritime Museum to develop the Port Center. This is interesting because now we see that there is an increasing integration between a historical explanation of the Port City heritage and the culture that is attached to the port activities and that has contributed to the development of a specific identity. And it is integrated in the same discourse and gradually um, from the past brings people from the past to today uh, creating a narrative in the people's mind which is important and it facilitates the explanation of this concept with these complex concepts that are very often behind uh, behind the functioning of, of ports. This is something that we see in other cases more recently in, in Dunkirk as well it opened another port center integrated in the port museum. Another interesting case of this uh, sort of second generation that I, that I have called is the case of, of Livorno that was uh, developed in, uh, in 2015 and is interesting for several reasons. It's interesting because it represents the adaptation of the concept. It is no longer necessary to make such a huge investment such as the leading ports were doing in the early 1980s, in the uh, early 1990s, but instead it is an adaptation to the specific context of historical port cities, such is the case, where they, uh, um, they link it to the fortress, 17th century uh, fortress, and it facilitates the management of this area, also brings people close to, the, um, to this piece of uh, this, this good, this maritime heritage good, we could say. And uh, it's interesting also because it allows the, uh, a more fluent dialogue between the historical uh, discourse and the explanation of what the port is today. It is also interesting because these uh, principles that I was saying before, uh, are also visible in the way they use the tools to explain the port today. So it is uh, very clear that we need to have more flexibility in the way we prepare our spaces. We don't know uh, uh, what changes may come. So they use uh, a new technology in order to explain the port in an entertaining way in a, uh, that is uh, more friendly for younger generations, but at the same is also more flexible. So in case it has to be relocated, they can uh, take it to another location they can uh, change the layout of the space and they can include it as they did in the uh, port debate. So as I was saying before, port centers are crucial also for the governance of the port city territory. Now, what we see more recently, and I think it's, is a, a very interesting evolution and very much adapted to, to the current times, particularly this uh, strange year that we are living, is how in what we could perhaps identify as a third generation um, there is an evolution towards the digital uh, port center. We see products that uh, remain uh, connected with a physical element that we defend still. That is, I think, positive because it can provide a face of the port. But it is also uh, the digitalization of port centers also allows increasing democratization of the tool. It is no longer necessary to make such uh, uh, heavy investments in the specific facility, but actually digital platform can work as a tool uh, to explain the port to a broader uh, audience. And this is what we see here in the uh, port center of, of Lorient in, in France, where no longer it's a, it's a big port, it's a medium, small, medium-sized uh, uh, port city. And we see here that, of course, the, there is, uh, they are far from the scale of cases like Rotterdam and Antwerp. But nevertheless, the port and the port activities play a very relevant role not just for the economic model of the uh, city and the region, but also for the identity and um, the, the conception of the territory and in, in this particular area. 
and we see how it is an approach that allows to include different tools such as the Carte de Borg to engage with the, with the younger generation. It is a bit more flexible uh, uh, and perhaps economically also more sustainable. Um, and it can be used and deployed in a specific event. So it is, this flexibility uh, also guarantees, um, and uh, it's easier to update uh, in, the, in the medium, short and long term. And it also allows a first in course, a first attempt in order to see how the tool works and later on decide on the return on investment and eventually evolve towards a more direct uh, deployment of economic resources for a physical, a physical facility. What is interesting is that we see that this, this concept is spreading. And I wanted to highlight this case here uh, because I think it's quite relevant for the Remember project. I think it could serve as inspiration as well is the port center of Côte d'Azur. It's also a digital platform, a digital port center developed in the framework of, um, of the Interreg uh, program you know, of cooperation between uh, Italy and France. And what is interesting besides being also part of an European project is that they build and they focus on disclosing the port culture and heritage, the existing port culture and heritage in a territory that is uh, quite diffuse, we could say. Uh, as uh, perhaps similar to what we may encounter in uh, in the Adriatic region, because the port city or the port heritage may not be exclusively located in a one single location, but it might be spread over a broader territory. So this allows also again a set of flexibility, and what is more important actually, it might it can allow the people to explore by themselves without being restricted to a specific uh, specific location, a specific opening hours, uh, and and so on. It's interesting as well because it's, as I was saying before, these flexibilities allow us to be uh, implemented or to take action in uh, specific events and eventually have an itinerary uh, mobile port center or, or you, have the, you can have the digital platform, but then in a specific events, you can deploy a specific, uh, one um, container where you can explain the port using VR or provide a different experience for the citizens, something that they may, may have not seen before. And again, also an interesting part of, of the project was that uh, they also developed a specific itineraries in which uh, the people could visit different stations um, and then using the mobile phone a bit in the way I was, uh, we were uh, seeing in the first video that shows what uh, uh, the digital ports uh, may be. So already implements this idea and is actually functioning quite well since the, digital, the, the content is available uh, digitally. Now, this is, uh, uh, I tried to, to summarize very quickly. I think later it's easier if you can read it by yourself, is, if it's possible to share the, the presentation. Uh, what is interesting is that we see an evolution from uh, something that is exclusive from large ports that can allow themselves the investment on large facilities to explain the port, city, uh, the, the port to, the, to the younger generations. We see how this concept gradually evolves and becomes a bit more democratized is something that we see in uh, port cities of all different scales using tools that can bring the, the, the people closer to the port uh, virtually and most importantly it can allow them to explore by themselves in a path of self-discovery of the port city uh, territory and again uh, we know that uh, the the content can be included uh, here in in our in our phones and before I end, I just wanted to share three ideas that I've seen in, in other projects that are not uh, linked to port centers, but I think they were already a bit mentioned in the initial uh, talk uh, by President uh, Mussolino. Uh, one example is here, the port town projects in the UK and it's a uh, Portsmouth, exploration of Portsmouth Sailor Town. It is an academic project that has been done in cooperation with cartography uh, companies. And it's interesting because because, because it suggests a path inside the uh, port city to the citizens so they can visit by themselves, they can get to a specific location, they can get the explanation of what this place is, what it means to the port city history and for the port city identity. And it's something that they can do also in Corona times uh, uh, where the social gatherings are uh, limited and uh, opening uh, and very often the cultural facilities have to remain uh, closed. Another idea that we shared in, um, 
in in uh, with our network very recently is the idea of port city insta works and this is something that builds a bit in the previous idea uh, that i was saying uh, of having paths uh, but this was developed by um uh, an expert from our network good friend uh, mr maurice jansen for the master students uh, in his courses in erasmus uh, university and it's interesting because it encouraged younger generation to interact with the port city culture port city heritage uh, in their own way, uh, giving certain tips. They, they, for example, in this case, they had to start or finish their itineraries in the Maritime Museum. They had to interpret the Port City culture in their own way, and they had to express it in uh, Instagram, in specific uh, Instagram uh, accounts, that then they are freely available for the people, for anybody that is curious and see what these students would uh, interpret. It's interesting because, uh, learning by doing uh, it can be more productive than having the the visitors of the citizens only in a, a passive um in a passive role now just a bit building on the same idea that uh, was said before i think augmented reality offers incredible opportunities it is something that for the moment i have not seen uh, connected to port centers and i think it's something that is really uh, worth exploring i think the remember project is an excellent opportunity to try to see how these new tools can be incorporated in the explanation of the port city uh, culture and, and the port city identity. It's something that we have seen uh, in, in other uh, museums, particularly in those that are open air museums or uh, archaeological sites. And this, uh, it can offer a broader understanding of the importance of this place for the evolution of the territory and the evolution of the port city um, identity and the positive relationship this is something that here has been uh, the two images is a bit more in a historical perspective but it could very well be uh, useful if somebody is seeing the port from an elevated place and it can't get direct information in its phone or its tablet so it, it is something that also responds very well to this idea that we were discussing earlier uh, some days ago about a, a, a port center diffuso, so diffuse in, in, in such a large territory, and is also corona-proof. So um, just to conclude, I think these are, we have seen that there uh, have been an evolution of, of the concept of the port center. Um, we, can, we have seen that it is a, a relevant tool to contribute to the AVP Agenda 2030 and to the Sustainable Development Agenda. And uh, uh, all I can say is that uh, we look forward to seeing the result of uh, the Remember project and what is going to be uh, developed. Uh, these digital museums that, in my opinion, could very well be digital port centers. And uh, hopefully in the next conference, I will share the good practices that have been developed in the Remember project. So thank you very much. Thank you to you, Dr. Sanchez, for your uh, fascinating uh, panorama of the Port Center, uh, which I have understood, which are the places in which will be possible for uh, territories, for cities, to reflect about themselves. It's quite fascinating and interesting perspective. Thank you. Over towards the technical section of our conference. In this section, speakers will present three main dimensions of Remember Project. The new museum experiences, the new tools of communication, and the new port city vision. The first dimension will be outlined by Mr. Domagoj Dradina, bringing the point of view of the National Museum Zada, that is one of the project partners of the Remember project. Mr. Dradina, it's up to you. Hvala, dobar dan svima. 
Ja se zovem Domagoj Dražina, radim u Narodnom muzeju Zadar i održat ću kratku prezentaciju o digitalizaciji. that took place uh, in this time uh, with digitalization and new technologies. Large amounts of data uh, could be shared with the public and through the internet museums can reach not only the usual audiences but also new kinds of audiences. In the 20th century the audience was satisfied by visiting museums. Nowadays, the public is asking for something more. They want to live, to experience the stories. So we should uh, be able to interpret uh, uh, what we exhibit. It is not just a question of the knowledge. There is a need for participation by the visitors. Visitors share the history of museums. And museums turn into interdisciplinary institutions. This does not only depend on the type of museums, but also on the requests of the public. New technologies are a perfect tool to, to face this challenge. It is necessary to create an interaction with the public and the digital content makes the experience more lively during uh, the visit. As regards the contents, uh, we have developers who create uh, a world that is accessible for visitors through the internet and by means of new technologies, digital technologies uh, find a new role in small museums. The Archaeological Museum of Zada uses technology in different ways. We have this screen with the digitalized images of our archive. 160,000 
photographs organized in four groups, prehistoric, antique, middle ages, new ages. And visitors can uh, look for the author they want to know about uh, or the text they are looking for. So we we have uh, uh, large screens that are sensitive to touch, so you can choose the subject by touching on the screen. The possibility to use images differently by means of interactive screens. And the museums, the museum has somehow uh, opened up to different uh, users, both experts, scholars, historians, local visitors, but also school children, for example. We have uh, organized a virtual visit to the museum. Uh, you can access it from our web page. And then we have 3D images of the Zadar, Zadar Forum. So we have this perfect collaboration between historic cultural heritage and uh, uh, recent technologies. We have a the Hera project, we have restored a small arsenal, a part of the medieval castle uh, that was used by the Venetian uh, military and then destroyed and then rebuilt when the new uh, wall system was being uh, developed. Only a few of its parts have been preserved, the lower part in particular and the entrance tower. And in 2017, after conservation and restoration, it became a center for visitors and a starting point for uh, an exploration of the fortification system of, of the city. Uh, just a few architectural works were carried out and in the small arsenal you can experience uh, two different uh, uh, approaches, a multimedia experience or instead uh, an approach without multimedia. Entering the arsenal, the space uh, becomes dark and uh, all images are projected on uh, a glass surface, vertical glass surface. The projection makes the glass opaque. Uh, there is a multi-touch uh, uh, control uh, area. And it is possible to see the different de the development in the centuries of this uh, fortification. And there is the possibility of interacting also on the floor. It is like a game for visitors. And then the light goes on and everything disappears. We have then the International Center for Underwater Archaeology. Uh, it is a category two center, according to UNESCO. It preserves and promotes uh, the underwater cultural heritage. Uh, 3D models were, de de were developed. Within the framework of the virtual arch project, 
and our center took part in this uh, project uh, as a, uh, a collaborating partner. There was uh, uh, an ancient Roman port in Barbir near Zadar. Uh, some stone structures remained, remnants of the two piers and breakwaters that enclosed and secured the port. Uh, this remains, uh, uh, and some archaeological findings, uh, made it possible to date back, date back the port to the 3rd and 4th century. The Hubble site was registered as an archaeological site in 1973. Uh, despite the great importance of this port, uh, the site uh, was unknown to the large public. Uh, only thanks to this virtual uh, uh, model, uh, the mobile uh, uh, applications uh, made it uh, uh, accessible to the larger public. The local population, by the way, had the possibility of getting to know something more about their past and to take care of the site, to preserve it. And finally, I'd like to mention the Museum of Wooden Shipbuilding close to Bettina. It is not part of the Remember project, but it promotes maritime culture and the maritime heritage of the Adriatic. It was inaugurated in 2015 to preserve uh, the tradition in shipbuilding and to transfer this knowledge to the future generations. Uh, it preserved the traditions of the Murtra island. Uh, there are many uh, digital applications uh, in the museum uh, and it has been made available to the larger public on the web. We created an interactive game for young visitors. Uh, uh, there is a, a shipyard, a classical shipyard, and the game uh, consists in building uh, a ship uh, in the shortest possible time. And this was made in order to, um, for in order for visitors to understand what was the process for the building of, of a ship. So this game uh, proposes what was the real process, building process. Each player can choose the color of the ship, which is then printed and you can take your ship home. This is clearly for younger visitors. We have uh, extremely positive reactions. And there are a number of uh, video animations uh, in the museum. We uh, show how a layout was being built, uh, a typical uh, ship of, the, of, of that time. And in the museum, there are a number of videos and documentaries on traditional uh, ceremonies, uh, fishing habits, uh, uh, the roots uh, used by the fishermen of, of the place. Uh, and this is all. Uh, for young people too, which means 
to think to the future, which is the most important thing we have. Thank you very much again. And now, and now, will be a presentation by Mr. Paolo Clini of the ICT dimension of the project. Paolo Professor of Architectural Drawing and Survey at Polytechnic, Polytechnic, pardon me, Polytechnic University of Marcia. That is also part of the Remember project. not to be here in person. Unfortunately, I have had to pre-record this speech of mine. I do hope that I will be able to uh, give you all the information you need uh, on this uh, topic. So, a virtual experience to rediscover cultural heritage. And this is especially important today, uh, considering the uh, pandemic situation we are living in. I only have a quarter of an hour, so I hope I will be able to provide you with the full information of uh, the topic that I have been assigned. Uh, all experiences uh, um, are based on the virtual, if you like, reproduction of something which is real. It is a way to be able to benefit in a more advanced manner of the heritage which is uh, really there. It is a very um, fascinating idea, that of the copy. Uh, I will just briefly touch upon this topic because I think that uh, the concept of copy has to be uh, touched upon in greater depth. It is a very ancient idea. We have here an example of a perfect reproduction of two ancient Greek statues, which we today perceive as almost being originals. And we see that this extraordinary ability that the ancient users have to reproduce uh, um, their heritage, which uh, allowed uh, the implementation of what uh, two ancient philosophers uh, um, hoped uh, for, uh, the concepts of ubiquity and Benjamin the uh, idea of uh, the technical reproduction of a piece of art, uh, that both focused uh, on uh, the copy as a common good, as is as the authentic realization of the enormous role of art, which is to become the common good, which can be seen and enjoyed anywhere and by anyone. It's a very uh, interesting concept. Septis, uh, and you can see his sentence here, he puts on the same plane the original and the copy saying that there is a strange tension between the original and the copy because the copy pays tribute to the original and recognizes its superiority uh, and at the same time uh, demands to replace it. The technologies that we have today enable us to establish and create uh, copies by reproducing it, them in an extraordinary degree of reality, we see those things that we might not indeed be able to see if we are looking at the actual the actual uh, piece of art. And very often, when we look at the original, we see less than what we can see in the copy. So how do we make these reproductions, these copies? It is through a dematerialization process which allows us to generate the conditions whereby we can establish this virtual experience. It enable us, enables us to create these digital facsimiles, which can be then, uh, which then can be introduced into different realities, the reality of augmented reality, immersive reality, mixed reality, blended reality. It is very important for this digitalization process to take place uh, scientifically. And on this, we could open up a whole chapter in which we could discuss uh, the role of uh, museums uh, in this uh, pandemic, how museums have shown or have not shown to have a digitalized, uh, a digitized uh, heritage. On the one hand, uh, coming back to our slides, uh, 
we have the uh, two the uh, acquisition of high definition uh, um, images and on the other hand we have the 3d techniques which is something very different and uh, on the one hand we have 2d scans on the other hand we have lasers which lead us to the establishment of post uh, point clouds which are at the core of all those models which we can create uh, in order to uh, provide this uh, virtual experience and to bring these artifacts into a very new world which is no longer the world of the places but as you can see um, is something really virtual but something that does not necessarily cannot necess it is not necessary to touch and this leads us into the uh, discussion on to exhibitions and virtual uh, exhibitions. A very important topic, I think, uh, for the quality of a digital experience is the detail. It is something quite new, if you like. It is something that uh, digital models allow us to really benefit of. These are 3D models. And I would like to show you this uh, dancing guitar. It is in the Archaeological Museum of uh, Marke. This is the ancient copy. This is a 3D model. I hope you can see it. Is a, it is in high resolution. But look at the detail, the concept of facsimile, which is not simply a morpho morphometric, but also a chromatic and a material-based facsimile. Another type of detail and I would like to thank our friends who uh, take care of the high definition resolution. Look at this. This is the Annunciation by Leonardo and see the details that we can actually capture in the hair, for example, of this character, this uh, unusual beauty and, and the detail that uh, we perhaps might not grasp uh, if we were looking at the original. This scientific digitization is the prerequisite for us to delve into new worlds. I only have a quarter of an hour, so I will go into this quite quickly. If you're interested, we can go into further detail of this, of course. This is the example of the vir of virtual reality. This is the reconstruction of a Roman theater, uh, laser-based regeneration of uh, the uh, model. This is a possible application through a monitor. And the model is being generated before my eyes. I can add a narrative to all of this. But look at these details. This allows us to see how we move uh, from the original to the um, virtual reality model. So this is what we uh, almost all know, these models which can be generated that enable me to see all this on a monitor. If these models are well made, we can move on to a new world, an altogether new world. This is a, an application of augmented reality on the same theatre. The device enables me to look at the, the plan the, of the theatre and this enables me to see this digital 3D model and this brings me into a totally new world. And I can move this onto a sheet of paper and the synchronization of the two models which overlap. This is a small scale of course, this is uh, designed for a museum approach but if we move into the new frontiers of uh, augmented reality this is what we can do. So starting from scientific digitization, we can have this one-to-one -one scale reproduction in real places. This is an archaeological park. Here you can see the uh, Decomanus. We have the, um, the shops that used to be there and the augmented reality generation of a model which enables me to navigate within it. It is all geo-referenced during my uh, visit. And here we have the example of a mosaic, mosaic of a mosaic that was in the bedchamber in the same archaeological site, which was uh, replicated in a uh, uh, in an augmented reality model. So this person is actually in what used to be the bedchamber, and we have 
the possibility to virtually walk on top of the mosaic to actually look at it in detail through the tablet which is being held by the person. Another experience this is a uh, really immersive experience. It is something which is very interesting for uh, archaeological parks. It enables us to blend augmented reality and cinema. Here we have a lady who is uh, moving a lantern. She is, as she moves, moves it along the um, along the wall. We see how um, the buildings are erected with the replication not only the 3D of the architecture, but with the inclusion also of uh, scenes of everyday life within that place. This is a uh, very attractive uh, augmented reality experience because it enables us to establish the context of these uh, archaeological sites. Immersive reality enables us to walk within these uh, places so we can actually walk inside uh, them this is the um, uh, study of duke uh, um, frederick this is an immersive reality uh, uh, system which enables this person to be actually moving inside this study and the user can actually see that study as though they were in the palace. However, there is also the opportunity to zoom into the details and to have a much more personal, much more intimate uh, um, relationship with the environment. This leads us into uh, another frontier, which is uh, that uh, of the circulation of digital artifacts and the circulation of places, which is a very interesting concept, which if we had more time, I would go into in further depth. Another example, which is very interesting, is uh, the ability to see artifacts in 3D formats without a device. This is a pseudo hologram. Using my hands, I can interact uh, with uh, these uh, um, pieces of art and, and by simply moving my hand, I can turn them around and examine them. It's interesting because uh, this is perfectly within uh, the strategies which are being implemented to bring 3D, to realize 3D before our eyes without actually using devices, be they tablets or be they uh, other devices which can, uh, um, which are not necessarily well tolerated. And then the virtual museums. I would invite you to have a look at this uh, uh, link. Uh, a lot of museums are generated as a virtual museum and this allows us to tour museums uh, uh, which has been very interesting of course uh, during the lockdown this is the um, Pinacoteca Civica of uh, Ancona where we can navigate inside the museum we can actually view all the different pieces uh, extrapolating many of the pieces in a 3D model and then, last uh, but not uh, least, uh, something that uh, I would like to show you. Unfortunately, there appears to, appears to be a problem in the reproduction of the recording. Will be highlighted by the representative of Central Adriatic Port Authority, Mr. Guido Vettore, which is the head of the of development, promotion, new project and communication. Mr. Vettore will discuss over past, present and the future of the Adriatic heritage, the Adrio network. And he will start with a video.
Buongiorno, buongiorno, buongiorno a tutti, eh, grazie professore e grazie ai relatori che mi hanno, mi hanno preceduto. I am the last speaker before the conclusions and I would like to tell you about the, sta the status, the present status of the network and uh, the Adrio project. Uh, the project started in 2019, focused on the virtualization of tangible and intangible heritage of port cities. At the same time, we dealt with an innovative aspect. We had not developed in other projects, that is, creating a network of uh, virtual museums connected among them, not eight individual museums, but rather a whole uh, uh, structure. On uh, uh, the 8th of November, on the 5th of November, we made a step forward. Ten partners involved in the project. We developed a logo, a graphic logo for the network. And at this point, I would ask to show the brief presentation video for uh, our network. As you have seen in the video, eight partners have uh, uh, come together in this network. We have uh, we have chosen Adrio as its name. We wanted a name that could put together uh, the two languages, uh, but that could be easily understood also outside the two areas. And we finally chose uh, the idea of the name and of the graphic uh, logo that will accompany these eight virtual museums. Past and present uh, in cooperation. We can certainly say that when we started involving the partners in these eight ports, we found common 
ideas but very different objectives and this was and still is our main uh, challenge the relationship between port and city is something that it is difficult to put into a, a scheme a precise scheme president musolino was referring to this capacity as the genius loci the ability to identify knowledge traditions uh, the physical and uh, uh, cultural heritage that is perceived as the local identity involving not only those who work within uh, the port structures uh, workers and their families but also involving those who live around the port area and therefore have a more indirect relationship with it this is something we have uh, seen in uh, in the discussion with all our partners, Ancona, Ravenna, Trieste, Venezia, uh, Rieka for our Croatian colleagues, uh, Split and Dubrovnik as well. We have had to identify very different starting points for the different realities and we wanted to add something more to have a, an added value uh, in the uh, development of the different uh, virtual museums and uh, in the relationships between ports and cities. So we decided to create a common platform. You have seen today in the video, uh, in, in the first video on Venice, uh, uh, the work on virtual museums is uh, continuing within June next year we think we will be able to present the network of virtual museums to the larger public at the same time however we have been building the Adrio dimension of this virtual platform a common presentation that will serve as an introduction, as a welcome to this network of eight museums telling visitors about the common elements because we have certainly identified a need for each of these eight virtual museums to create a dialogue with the different port infrastructures in the network. A virtual museum could not go on by itself. So walking on this uh, fil rouge, as we defined it in the beginning, we managed to define a common identity, this logo I have just presented, that is based on two different levels, a narration that will be at the beginning, at the entrance of this virtual platform, and a journey uh, on the different uh, sides of the Adriatic, and an intermediate dimension with three different routes, tradition and culture, history and heritage, where the dialogue will be among contents in the different virtual museums that will be included in a single journey, in a single uh, journey, uh, a, an experience through the eight different museums uh, rather than the visit to one single mu virtual museum alone. not a vertical approach but rather a horizontal approach uh, based for example on uh, the use of modern technologies thus creating something that has its own consistency made up of uh, the eight individual unit units this has enabled each one of our partners to
to face two different approaches, the involvement of the local communities on one hand, uh, to let them feel that the creation of this virtual museum is something that belongs to them. We can also define them as sports centers. And on the other hand, the desire to involve in the dialogue all those who uh, transit uh, through these port uh, realities. And this is uh, another way to uh, uh, to welcome our customers, introducing them in the local reality of the port, the traditions, uh, the uh, knowledge of that area, not only uh, in the port uh, area, but also creating a dialogue with the mainland and the surrounding territory. Some lessons we have learned it, we have learned the relationship between port and city is an extraordinary engine to uh, restructure the virtual museums in port cities but it is also something that is uh, extremely varied depending on the individual experiences of the port cities. And this capacity to generate involvement, not only of those uh, who uh, find their identity in port cities, and not only as far as historic aspects are concerned, we refer to them as virtual museums, but in reality, they, these museums will tell us what ports are today, will tell us about their ability to adjust, to change. And then the added value of the size of the network that puts together different elements, identifies a geographical area, and then for each individual port, by stressing the common elements, is able to find traces of uh, innovation uh, that leaves common elements in the, uh, the different situations. This is somehow uh, the narration about the ability of port cities and uh, uh, the cities around them to interpret change rather than being subjected to it. I stop here and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Vettorel. So the future will be a tale, a network, and a technology. They will be the same thing, but it will happen only in the past. Thank you very much. And uh, now we are arrived at the last speech of this conference. And to sum up all the ideas and the cues provided by all the previous speakers, we are in the precious hands of Miss Valeria Mancinelli, which is the major of Ancona, not only, but she is national delegate for port city issues for the Association of Italian Municipalities. And under this role, she is part of the National Sports Conference, the highest or coordination body for port policy in the Italian government. Madame Mancinelli, the floor is yours. Buongiorno, buongiorno a voi e grazie per, darmi, per avermi dato l'opportunità di portare, spero, 
ancora che piccolo contributo a questa on such an important uh, topic. For uh, some months uh, now, I also hold uh, the role as a uh, uh, coordinator for the uh, Association of Italian Municipalities. And from this point of view, I think that many of the things that I will mention now, and that are the results of the of my personal experience as uh, mayor of uh, the city of uh, Ancona are of course uh, very close uh, to the needs uh, felt by my city of Ancona but are also broadly uh, acknowledged also by many of the uh, port cities which are represented here and uh, of port cities in general. They are indeed the uh, considerations that uh, uh, can basically overlap uh, with the thoughts uh, that emerge from many uh, Italian port cities. It is indeed true, especially here in uh, Italy, but not only where port cities have a, um, a long-standing uh, tradition. As I was saying, it is true that port cities were established uh, around the commercial ports. This is true for the city of Ancona, for example. And a lot of the uh, monumental heritage, uh, a lot of the uh, physical uh, signs that uh, recall the identities of the cities as it was built up over the centuries, are actually inside the uh, port uh, area or in its immediate vicinity. This is true for Ancona. Inside uh, our port uh, uh, territory, there are, the, um, there are traces of the ancient uh, Roman port, uh, which was uh, reinforced by Trajan. Uh, as a result of uh, the need uh, to reinforce uh, the garrisons in uh, Tracia and elsewhere. And close to the port, I would say right at the side of the port, there is the medieval city of Ancona that dates back uh, to the age of the uh, maritime uh, republics and there there is the cathedral that was established 1000 years ago which is on a hill which looks over the port so not just over the sea but the port so we have very tangible signs that show how the city uh, embraces the port With my contribution, I would like to reinforce and support the uh, assumptions that were put forward by all the speakers who preceded me, and uh, which is further testified in the contributions and the uh, events described by previous speakers. And I can very briefly give you an overview of our experience and how the port is so important for the life of our city. It is clear that the role of the uh, ports within the city is very broad. Over the last uh, seven years in which I have been mayor of the city, my administration has sought uh, together with all the other parties concerned, including the Port Authority, has, um, as I was saying, all these activities which have been performed have surprised us uh, positively because we have been, enab uh, been able to rediscover 
this positive relationship between the city and uh, the port, not only from an economic point of view, but also from a cultural point of view by which we understand the something which is the an essential part of the uh, community's identity. This uh, positive experience has also been surprising, as I was saying, because it has enabled us to rediscover the relationship between the port and the city. It has uh, provided uh, an answer to a very important topic and to important need which is uh, expressed, uh, that is, to find uh, our identities. The uh, liveliness of globalization and the intensity of change has led uh, to a number of both positive and negative effects. In this part of the world, it has uh, powerfully undermined our certainties. It has undermined our ability to uh, reconnect to our roots. And this creates anxiety, fear, which goes well beyond the concrete uh, consequences of economic crises. Over the years, also here in Ancona, I have seen the uh, arising of a very clear need uh, to rediscover one's identity. The rediscovery of the relationship between the port and the city has provided an answer to this fundamental need. And it has occurred not uh, as a result of a, a plan established a priori, by which I mean that uh, in my first mandate, which expired in 2018, I, together with the coalition that supported the uh, my administration, we did not have this clearly in mind. We discovered all of this uh, as we proceeded in time. Very concretely, one of the first uh, projects that we worked on from 2015, uh, together with the Port Authority, leading us to examine the uh, real relationship between the port and the city was uh, the uh, that which led us to tear down the barriers between the port and the city in what we call the ancient port where we indeed find the uh, examples and traces of the uh, uh, port of Trajan. We uh, find the uh, uh, arches, we find the visible traces of the Roman port. All that part of the port was uh, gradually abandoned uh, by commercial traffic, also for uh, uh, very clear operative reasons, and was given back to the city by tearing down the fences and uh, by implementing uh, a series of activities to recover the connection with the town enabled this uh, part of the port to be re-given back uh, to the um, city. It is a place where the citizens can now walk, uh, where cultural events take place, uh, where one can uh, enjoy a fish meal in the evenings in summer. And it has been such a powerful um, initiative. And, and I remember the inauguration that took place on the 26th of uh, July in 2016. It was an event that attracted hundreds and hundreds of people. From that moment on, it really was uh, um, the trigger for a mass process involving most of our citizens that really had an enormous uh, uh, impact in uh, creating greater empathy between the city and its port. A very important moment in time where the city refound its identity, discovered its roots, uh, and also discovered 
its pride in its history. This identity was rediscovered as uh, perfectly fitting in uh, the current world, where identity reassures it is a uh, an identity that is ontologically based on the sense of opening. Uh, the idea that the port is a gateway that enables us to receive uh, people and uh, uh, cultures, but also to move out to other people and cultures. It is a gateway which is reassuring, that uh, comforts us in our relationships with the world, uh, and uh, that indeed perfectly suits uh, the needs of the current world. This new empathy led uh, to a new mechanism whereby, in a second stage, this um, also provided guidance uh, to uh, the uh, governance of the city. As we opened up the uh, ancient port, we had thought of it as a step in the requalification of the city's uh, ancient fabric, but we didn't imagine that it would give us the thrust uh, that I mentioned, which in turn guided the subsequent uh, governance choices by uh, the administration and by all the other institutions uh, involved uh, in the territory, starting obviously from the Port Authority, the University and many other partners. This uh, thrust and this uh, newly found identity in the relationship between the city and the port uh, very clearly guided the definition of the city's uh, strategic plan and also guided the choices um, made in terms of financing and investment uh, and also aroused uh, the initiatives made by private parties the uh, strategic plan was built uh, between uh, 2015 and 2016. It was finally approved uh, in uh, the early months of 2017. And that plan included not only the guidelines for economic development, many of which were very clearly focused uh, on uh, port activities and uh, the economy of the seas, But also, as regards the physical transformation of the city, the strategic plan focused uh, not only on specific economic guidelines, but also on other strategic projects aimed at physically transforming the city. And all these aims focused uh, on the Gulf area of the city. That is, all those areas that uh, uh, contribute to the relationship between the port and the city. The uh, research for financing focused on this. We invested all the financing that we achieved uh, through uh, integrated territorial um, um, funds uh, that uh, support uh, projects uh, that uh, range from uh, uh, requalifying the illumination system for uh, the uh, seafront area to the uh, architectural recovery of Palazzo degli Anziani, for example, which is a medieval uh, palazzo which used to host uh, the um, city's administration during the uh, maritime uh, republics. A number of uh, interventions made on the medieval city, and it's also guided us uh, in the establishment uh, uh, in uh, that uh, area that uh, is uh, the uh, the point of contact as said between the sea uh, and um, uh, and the city the entire strategic plan as i was saying of the city is made of aims and strategic uh, projects that are all very well defined. Uh, all of these were guided by the rediscovery of the relationship between the sea 
the port and the city. The strategic plan is being implemented. 50 to 60 percent of the uh, pro of the projects are uh, already underway. The rest is in the pipeline. This enables us to bear witness to the fact that uh, indeed the economic, the cultural value in the city's heritage, a uh, tangible heritage uh, offered by the port uh, to the city and to the world uh, is important in order for it to be uh, consumed, if you like, by the world. At the same time, this cultural heritage, uh, which is made not only of monuments, but of pieces of history of the city, is indeed the uh, essential raw material to uh, give an answer to the needs of the contemporary world. First and foremost, uh, the need for an identity and uh, the establishment of a new empathy between the port uh, and uh, the city with a mass experience which involves uh, um, thousands of uh, people. This means that the beating heart of the city and of the community has uh, uh, taken part in all of this. Uh, this shows us that the uh, more effective strategic plans must uh, necessarily go back to a heritage made of uh, specialized uh, knowledge of expertise, of professional expertise. However, in order to be uh, um, real, they must indeed also include uh, the uh, way in which the uh, citizens uh, empathetically experience their surroundings. This has also enabled us to answer, provide an answer to the need for the city of Ancona to relate with the rest of the territory that it is part of. So looking not only towards the sea, but also towards its hinterland the region, the strong identity which is not seen as the establishment of something in opposition to something else, but very simply the ability to identify one's roots, uh, which has enabled us to gain a new perception of our city and to be seen uh, under new lights by the surrounding territory. It has also enabled us uh, to um, obtain a different reputation, if you like, vis-a-vis -vis the local territory and to better um, act as a main city of our small region. This being a very complex uh, uh, topic in a small region such as ours. The um, promotion of the tangible and intangible cultural heritage of the ports and everything that surrounds the ports, uh, the usefulness of this uh, as a resource uh, to uh, rise uh, to the needs of this third millennium is indeed uh, something that we have managed to achieve in our city. And I will draw to the conclusions by saying that similar experiences uh, as ours, uh, and despite we have different monuments and different histories, can, I think, be replicated by any mayor in any port city in Italy. So, we have been convinced uh, by the exper our experience, uh, so uh, ours has been a, uh, the real, uh, we have really experienced uh, the uh, impact of all of this. So, thank you very much for uh, the contribution that you have allowed me to give to the project. Um, 
Ava. His own speech, passionate, civil, and political, it's impossible to add something, some words. It's impossible to give a conclusion with words. So, what I suggest is to see again the video on Adrian Network. But remember, remember, the Adriatic Park Cultural Network is looking for work to welcome you in this space-time experience along the two shows of Adriatic Sea. Thank you very much. Paul.